NEPM's podcasts are funded by Armbrook Village Senior Living in Westfield, offering assisted living and compass memory support with evidence-based treatment for those with memory loss. More at armbrookvillage.com. Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Later in the show, we're showing you some places to have a good time in the four counties of Western Mass. I could have worded that better. But you did it. <laughs> and yet, it does not lessen my excitement for loud music in unlikely places. We'll take you into the woods for a celebration of loud music in all of its forms. RPM Fest is about to open a can of metal and more for the eighth time over the past 10 years. We'll speak with founder and organizer Brian Westbrook about the Western Massachusetts heavy music scene, building a festival in his backyard, and how you can get a taste of what's to come at a fundraising event they're holding at Prodigy in East Hampton this weekend. While we're in East Hampton, there's a new hotspot on the verge of opening there in the East Works building. Thursday, we'll see the Jupiter Club open its doors, and we had a chance to sit with proprietor Sean Mitchell to talk about how the city has evolved to this point, what this new space seeks to bring to both the building that houses it and the greater community writ large, and the cosmic connections that brought them the name. Speaking of heavenly bodies, how many black holes do we have to taste to get to the one that is just right? Don't lick black holes, Khalees. <laughs> I need to make my own mistakes, Monty. To boldly go where no man has gone before. At the Amherst kitchen table of Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe, luckily there were no big news stories <laughs> that happened <laughs> over the weekend politically to talk about. And we can distract ourselves with things that are of larger magnitude importance in the astronomical scale of things than the small and silly things that we humans do on this planet. One of the things is finding a black hole that's just the right size. <laughs> uh, or you can think of it as a political commentary that we would rather be in a black hole than in the current situation. And that the news cycle has been drawn into a black hole of what happened over the weekend. So, black holes. Right, so we have talked a lot about black holes. Uh, there are two types that are usually common and we talk about one are sort of like star-sized black holes. Uh, and they form when large stars, stars that are bigger than our sun, when they die. And so you have these black holes in our galaxy as well, in other galaxies as well, which you would expect because we know large stars exist. And we know when they die, they end up as a black hole. Just as a clarification, our sun is never going to be a black hole. It's going to end up in a state which is called a white dwarf. But so we know these are called stellar mass black holes. Uh, these are like, you know, a few times the mass of our sun to maybe a hundred times you can go or a little bit more. Then, my favorite black holes. Mine too. Black holes at the centers of galaxies. Uh, and there is a black hole uh, in the center of our own galaxy, Milky Way. It's about four million times the mass of our sun. So you can already see there is a big distinction. Individual star-sized black holes a few times the mass of our sun, at the centers of galaxies, now we are talking about million times the mass of our sun, or tens of billion times. The black hole at the center of our own galaxies is relatively small, because you can have black holes that are billion times the mass of our sun. Uh, for example, uh, the image that we saw of the shadow of the event horizon a few years ago was at the center of a galaxy, and that black hole is about a billion times the mass of our sun. These two types we knew. We didn't say the name of the second type, which is the coolest part of it. Supermassive black hole. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, actually. That is the coolest part about it. No, uh, and, and if you've seen uh, the movie Interstellar, there the black hole was of a supermassive black hole type. Goodbye, Taj. Goodbye, Dr. Brent. See you on the other side, Coop. So, you have these two different types. Small and supermassive. Really big. So the question was, well, as astronomers like to do, wait a minute, what about something in between? And they said, we'll come up with a cool name, Intermediate Mass Black Holes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's an all right name, I guess. And again, the formation mechanism of these black holes, the stellar mass ones, the star-sized ones, and the supermassive black holes are different. Uh, Stellar-sized ones, when the star uh, implodes or explodes, it turns into a black hole. Supermassive black holes, we are getting closer to the understanding of them, but we still really don't know if galaxies form around these black holes and black, these big black holes are seeds, 
or at the centers of these galaxies, the density of stars is so high that it forms a lot of black holes and they merge to become big. So the question was, well, if we can find something in between, uh, perhaps that can help our understanding as well. But do they exist? And astronomers have been looking for black holes on the scale of about 10,000 mass of our sun-sized black holes. And so far, there were tantalizing clues, but there was no conclusive evidence where we can say, aha, this is it, up until very recently. Where did they find this intermediate-sized black hole? Well, so there is a globular cluster. So you have, uh, around our galaxy as well, and around other galaxies as well, you have these blobs of clusters, which are called globular clusters. Clusters of what? A cluster of stars. And I would have called them blobular clusters, but, uh, but astronomers call it globular clusters because they look like globs. What's the difference between a glob and a blob? <laughs> Nobody knows. That's the mystery of astronomy. It's kind of like a mass that keeps getting bigger and bigger. The Blob, starring Steve McQueen and a cast of exciting young people. That's the next <laughs> mystery. So these uh, clusters, uh, this is when you, you are forming mostly, you are forming stars, star forming regions like Orion, but bigger star forming regions. You can form a lot of stars together. And then they stay together as well in a glob or a blob, <laughs> this would be tricky. And these you can have uh, 100,000 to a million stars in these globular clusters. Now, they are densely packed. You know, the, uh, the nearest star to us, Proxima Centauri, or the, Alpha, or the Centauri star system, that is about four light years away. Well, in a globular cluster, this space of four light years would be full of stars. So there are a lot more stars. The density is, uh, is very high. And so astronomers thought that perhaps if you are trying to look for these intermediate mass black holes, you look for at the centers of these globular clusters. Maybe we will find them. Because it's hard to find black holes because they don't emit light. You have to figure out some other way, either if the, something gas is going around it and it forms an accretion disk. Or like the Amherst trash day where it takes your recycling and just dumps it into the black hole itself. And where it goes, nobody knows. No, it goes to the Murph, I think, oh. in Amherst. We did a tour about that. You can listen to the podcast from Earth Day, where we went. Oh, no, wait, Amherst doesn't go there. They're Scot they, they have their own way of doing things. I forgot. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so, so that is one way you can form globular clusters. But there is one other interesting way, and that is that if you have a small galaxy, a dwarf galaxy, and you can strip out its stars then you can be left off with a center which is very dense and that may mimic, in some sense, a globular cluster. And so astronomers thought, well, if you have black holes at the centers of large galaxies, maybe we can find it in some sort of like these smaller galaxies and maybe if there is a globular cluster which is close by, we can find it in there. And that's what astronomers did. There is a globular cluster in our own galaxy. It is called Omega Centauri. It is visible from the southern hemisphere, actually to the naked eye. If you are in a dark spot, you can see it. I haven't seen it yet, uh, but uh, you can see it's sort of like the size of a full moon. It's a cluster of stars. It's an unusual globular cluster because it's very big. You're going to the southern hemisphere pretty soon though, right? You can... I, I am. I'm going to Cape Town uh, for uh, International Astronomical Union's General Assembly. I'm going there in early August. Hopefully we can do a segment from there. That would be really cool. Uh, I don't know if from Cape Town it would be visible or not. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. But nevertheless, so Omega Centauri, it's unusual because it's a much bigger globular cluster than usual. It has about 10 million stars. And just to give you an idea, 10 million stars are compressed in about 75 light years. 10 million. Which, and, 10, so our, and for context, our sun is, what, nine light minutes away. That, that, that's right. And, and the nearest star system is about four light years away. The, the radius, so, so this would be around 150 light years across this cluster. Mm -hmm. And in 150 light years, normally you would expect about 100 stars, 150 stars. Here you have 10 million stars. So that's a lot of stars. Yeah. But also this particular globular cluster, for various reasons, we know it has properties that don't match up with other globular clusters in our galaxy. We, in our galaxy, we have about 150 of those. And again, other galaxies have those too. But these are generally old objects. But this Omega Centauri is a little bit younger 
Uh, but I should also mention, uh, which I thought was cool, that Omega Centauri was actually catalogued by Ptolemy in his wow. Almagest about 2,000 years ago. Mm. So anyway, so this cluster has been known. Uh, at that time, they didn't know what that was, but now we know that it's a globular cluster. And astronomers had been suspicious uh, that there is a, maybe a black hole in the middle. Uh, astronomers also look for black holes at the centers of globular clusters because there are so many stars and they are gravitationally interacting with each other that there's something happens which is called mass segregation, meaning to say the bigger objects fall towards the center and the lighter objects get a kick and they sort of like you know, fluff up the globular cluster. So if you have a, glob a bl big black hole, they expected it to be going to the center of these globular clusters. But again, so far, there had been no confirmation of these intermediate black holes at the centers of globular clusters, except that in Omega Centauri, astronomers had been looking at it for over 20 years using Hubble Space Telescope. One of the indications, and, or one of the things that people were asking was, if there is a black hole, a big black hole at the center, then there should be stars close to it, which are at very high speeds. Because of black hole's mass, black hole can speed up those stars, and those stars are still there rather than being shot out from the globular cluster. Meaning to say, if you find high-speed stars at the center, their speed is bigger than the escape velocity of the cluster, they shouldn't be there. Or at least, by coincidence, maybe a, one star is there, but not a few. And in this particular case of Omega Centauri, Hubble Space Telescope observed the motion of stars. So now you are looking at stars moving. You can actually see them over a period of time, over 20 years, and they notice that there are seven stars there that actually have speeds that are greater than the escape velocity of the cluster, and yet they are part of the cluster and, and right towards the center. Uh, and, and I should just mention, like, you know, that this uh, star cluster is around 17,000 light years away. So not too far, if you think about it. This is within our own galaxy. And so that suggests that there is a black hole in the middle. And by measuring the speed of the stars and the way they are moving around, they can figure out what is the ma expected mass of the central object, which we cannot see. So we can only infer from these stars. Because we can't see a black hole, because light cannot escape from a black hole, but all the evidence is pointing towards this globular cluster, 17,000 light years away, that we found our first not stellar mass black hole, not supermassive black hole, as we have in the center of our galaxy, but one right in the middle. And it's like an economy car-sized black hole. And they found that this black hole has a mass of around 8,200 times the mass of our sun. So not like a couple hundred times the mass of our sun, like a stellar mass black hole, and not like a million or billion times the size of our sun, like a supermassive black hole. I should also mention that it's a cool thing about it, that one of the reasons why astronomers have so many images of Omega uh, Centauri, or the center of that region, is because Hubble Space Telescope was actually using that cluster for calibrations. So they were actually taking just a lot of pictures. Okay, well, is it look the same? Is it looks the same? And so they had a lot of pictures of this particular cluster, which over 20 years, you can actually map those out and see if there are stars that you can see their motion, their positions change a little. This is a very hard thing to measure, especially because you are looking at the center of a cluster. But Hubble Space Telescope has the ability to look at individual stars. And it they actually mapped 1.4 million stars. I mean, it's, it's just mind-boggling if you think about it, like, you know, that they, they mapped about 1.4 million stars in, in which they found the positions of seven stars change in a way that suggested they are moving much faster than they should if they were part of the cluster, or sort of like, you know, their, their escape velocity. They should have escaped from the galaxy, uh, from the cluster, because they were moving at high speeds. But because they were not, those seven stars suggest that there is a intermediate mass black hole at the center of Omega Centauri. We can use this as a metaphor that if the news cycle of this past weekend is sucking you in, you can let it suck you in in a super massive way, which might be too much and too depressing. You can let it suck you in in a stellar mass way, which may be not enough, but maybe somewhere in the middle, 
You let yourself get sucked into these news stories. But keep in mind that there's a big, vast universe out there, and none of this is going to matter by the time whatever is happening in that globular cluster right now finally reaches the Earth. And that even when you look at Omega Centauri, you are looking at millions of stars, and it has taken 17,000 years for the light to get to us. Our small little problems on four-year cycles, those are actually much less than the cosmic scale. On the way, it might get loud, which is to say it's definitely going to get loud. The usually quiet town of Montague, Massachusetts, is the home of the region's premier heavy music campout. The RPM Fest returns to Montague later this summer, and we'll talk with the festival founder, Greenfield native Brian Westbrook, about how this assumedly very folk-focused valley actually has an incredible heavy metal history. But up next, from an intermediate black hole to Jupiter, the brand new Jupiter Club opens at Eastworks in East Hampton this week, and we'll talk with East Hampton's own Sean Mitchell about the changes he's seen to his city in his lifetime and how he's hoping his new club will be a part of it. And we'll talk about an underwear party. Okay. They're more fun than they sound. <laughs> You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by Northeast Solar, homegrown in Hatfield, Massachusetts, and providing energy savings for their customers for over 10 years. Learn more at northeast-solar.com. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. We're here with Sean Mitchell, who is the owner and one of the managing partners of a new club that is set to open in East Hampton, the Jupiter Club. This is an event space. This is a nightclub. Is it all of the above? I'd say all of the above for sure. We're trying to cater to the cultural resurgence in East Hampton that's happening right now. Event space that could be um, from comedies to dance parties, any way that you can have fun in East Hampton, we want to be a part of that. We want to facilitate this cultural resurgence. On the other side of things, we're doing, you know, the biggest event in people's lives is usually their wedding. And we're definitely a, a, a full-service uh, wedding venue as well. Private parties, whether they're baby showers, corporate events, or you just want to rent out a place to have, you know, a great 50th or something, that's Jupiter Club. A lot of things have been in that particular space. In Eastworks, which I, we should mention, like this is going to be like on the first floor of Eastworks. Is your name, however accidentally, a nod to uh, Apollo Grill being in that same space? Slightly. That did cross my <laughs> mind. Um, so Apollo that, Grill was a restaurant that was there for a long, long time, yeah. also an event space, but now yeah. Jupiter Club. Yeah, that's perceptive. Um, <laughs> Apollo never went to Jupiter. Yeah. No. <laughs> Could have called it the Moon Club, I suppose. There's a little bit more to that. So that, that thought did cross my mind, and, but the actual the suite number, it's Suite 121 at the Eastworks building. And if you look up the, the symbol for Jupiter, it looks like a one, a two, and a one merged together. So once I saw that, too, I'm like, this is a sign. <laughs> L- literally. Uh, and now um, it's the sign. <laughs> yeah. You know, naming is always difficult. Yes. Um, I've been involved in other bu- business ventures, too, and it's it's hard to get it right. And it's an industrial chic type atmosphere. Uh, we're going with a speakeasy vibe, an art deco type decor. Uh, I think Jupiter Club kind of like lands that nicely. Has it been hard planning this around being in Eastworks? Sometimes, like, especially with things going late night, sometimes there are issues with the building and the people who live there. Yeah, yep. There's um, there's residents on the, the fourth floor. We're on the first, so there is a good amount of separation. But, yeah, we, we want to be mindful of just their their personal space. Like, they live here. This isn't just a place of business for them. They don't want a rocking party into, you know, the wee hours of the morning. I don't know why. Um, yeah. Maybe so. not every morning. <laughs> Maybe not every <laughs> morning. Some morning. But, like, I mean, you have so, like, far to go to get home. I know, right? If yeah. there's a party. Like, come on. Just, yeah. <laughs> just come out and rock a little. Yeah. If you live in a mill building, you probably aren't trying to, like, have the white picket fence and the nuclear family thing yeah. in the first place. Maybe I'm wrong. But, uh, yeah, maybe you want a party late at night. So. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> come downstairs. <laughs> Actually, one of the first parties might be for the tenants, a private party that's not advertised, just to say, hey, you know, we want to be good neighbors. Thank you for welcoming us to the space, and uh, we look forward to just being a cool part of the building. We're speaking with Sean Mitchell, who is the owner of the new Jupiter Club, which is set to open July 18th. Let's, that's the first event that is will be open to the public. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening on July 18th. Yep, July 18th, 7 o'clock. Invitations um, are going out to 
a wide variety of people. If you're just you know, okay, so not open to the whole public. <laughs> I won't turn anybody away. Um, <laughs> if you're a resident of East Hampton and you hear about it, stop by. We're having a great time. Um, but we're also inviting just business leaders, other people that are involved in event production, DJs, florists. We we really view it as we're joining a community. So we want to bring that community to us just to let people know that there's someone new in town and, and, and you can bring your clients to us. If someone's trying to plan a wedding or a big event, ho- hopefully we're at the top of mind. What were you doing prior to uh, opening the Jupiter Club, Sean? My background is in the construction industry. Uh, my wife's background is in hospitality. Um, she took a break to raise our daughter, and then she was on the side like doing substitute teaching. But that's kind of, uh, you know, just as things change, times change. Um, she's looking to get back more in an engaged way in the workforce. And um, that's our bar manager, my mm-hmm. wife. And her sister inv- has been involved in event planning herself. So the three of us kind of combined, I- I'm exiting the uh, construction industry myself. Um, and this was a good investment. It, it was a kind of the right place, right time. As you mentioned, it was a club beforehand, and it was uh, it was really killed by COVID. So it barely had a chance to like stand up. But it's such a cool space. It's just sitting there collecting dust, and it was just a matter of time, I think, till somebody came and and scooped it up. I had some interactions with the owner of the building, and we just got to talking, and uh, it really evolved organically from that point on. I, you know, me looking for a change in lifestyle, my wife needing, you know, a new a new source of income, um, and our manager too. And it all just kind of came together like, hey, you know what, this, this is going to work for us, and it's going to work for this community. Yeah, I think everything that's been in that space has been pretty fun in general, although from what you're saying, I can't necessarily expect many underwear parties in your future. <laughs> I'm not ruling it out. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about the underwear parties. Yeah. Well, there were, I can't remember if it was when it was Club 121 or if it was the iteration before, but um, they were doing a lot of just broader t- open to the public parties with uh, local promoters and stuff. And yeah, you, it's the underwear party. You show up and you dance in your underwear and then you go home. Um, well, all right. Hey. <laughs> I DJed a couple of these parties. It was really fun. Yeah, that sounds Did fun. you DJ in your underwear? Yes. Team nice. player. Team well, player. there's an idea for you for the yeah. new Jupiter Club. Uh, let me write that. I should have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, underwear dance parties. I, I wouldn't say that they're, this is such a weird sidebar. <laughs> I wouldn't say that they're inherently queer, but everyone who comes to them is really respect, like oddly respectful in a way that you wouldn't, that some people wouldn't necessarily expect. But like, yeah, they're just like super fun. Yeah. Very, very reaffirming about yeah. just being alive. Anytime I go to the beach, I always, in the back of my mind, think if anyone dressed like this right now, anywhere else but here, everyone would kind of react strangely. But when nobody's reacting strangely here, so it's all about context. Yeah. Well, yeah. on that underwear-related tangent, <laughs> um, we're speaking with Sean Mitchell, who is going to be opening the Jupiter Club in Eastworks, 121, Suite 121. You were talking before about part of the reason you wanted to do it is because of the East Hampton Renaissance, all these exciting things that have been going on in East Hampton. Talk about the business community of East Hampton, working with city officials about trying to start another business to be part of this renaissance. Yeah. So I grew up in East Hampton. During my childhood, that whole area was kind of run down. Mm -hmm. Um, There wasn't much going on. Eastworks kind of had some businesses, but overall, it, it, it it resembled more of an abandoned factory than a place that you would go have a good time. On that note, leaders in East Hampton, whether it's been business leaders or the actual town government, everybody's been just great at kind of facilitating our own vision. And that includes the building management, the the, the man that owns it. Uh, his name's Will Bundy. He's really a, a, a great visionary in a way. You know, he owns this entire building. You know, it's hundreds of thousands of square feet. And he could just kind of rent it out and maybe it could be man- more manufacturing. He, he could do a lot less creative things with it, but he really seems to want to get artists involved in music and just kind of, he wants to lean into the cultural aspect of East Hampton as well. And that seems to be the general mood in East Hampton, even outside the Eastworks building, everywhere. Like like I said, I, as a kid, there was a lot of closed shops. Or there wasn't fun places to go or, or places to dance, get you know creative cocktails, listen to music. 
It was dive bars, and that's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe some broken glass here and there on the sidewalks, but always um, a good time. Yeah, I mean, I still think the Peter Pan is kind of scary. Yeah, <laughs> it is. When you, yeah, I used to ride my bike by the Peter Pan, and it's like, oh my god, like you kind of get the the door like hangs open a little bit too long. You're like, ooh, did they, <laughs> did they see me? <laughs> um, but I think those days are over in East Hampton. You know, they're they're sweeping up the glass and they're welcoming all sorts of entrepreneurial activity in in the in the city, and I, I, I that's really top down. I mean, residents, when you tell them about it, they're excited. Uh, the mayor's office, excited. I mean, I was just doing some basic permitting and licensing, and the assessor's office is, you know, kind of talking talking me up, and they want to know more, and they're excited, and they wanted to talk about um, line dancing, actually. Somebody was involved with that, so that might be another thing in a, an underwear, underwear dance party. Underwear party, line yeah. dancing, we yeah. got all these I ideas mean, like, for you, right? Plus, like, I mean, like, you do have one of those spaces where, and it's one of the few, like, really big spaces that people could actually dance in. And it's a thing that this area doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of. This is a space for people to just go and dance. I've been talking a lot with queer community about this. Yeah, no, <laughs> you're recently. 100%. I was like, where do we go dance? I don't know. Where do we go dance where there's space to dance? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and actually the, the, the man that was interested in line dancing, they go to Worcester that far of a drive, it took me aback a little bit that he's going all, he, he lives in East Hampton. He's going to Worcester to dance. I was like, this has to be solved. We can fix this. Yeah, yeah. I got an idea. Right here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're speaking with Sean Mitchell, who's set to open the Jupiter Club in the Eastworks building on July 18th. It'll be open for events and private events and weddings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you grew up in East Hampton. And sometimes when somebody grows up in a city and it it explodes in the way East Hampton has, even in the 20 years that I've lived in the Valley, gone from kind of being like, oh, East Hampton's someday going to be the next Northampton. Mm-hmm to kind of being, and in some ways surpassing Northampton, at least over the last couple of years. How does somebody who grows up in that town feel about that? You seem generally excited. I've seen people grow up in towns like that, boom towns, that then are like, oh, the new people here, they're ruining things the way they used to be. I'd rather go back to the Peter Pan bar and that yeah. kind of thing. But I think you'll always have those people that want to re- reach back into that nostalgia of yesteryear, thing, the way things were, and they remember through rose tinted glasses how things were. Mm-hmm. They don't remember the they remember only the good feelings and not the bad. And, and and me just growing up, I mean, it could be a dangerous place like the bike path right behind East Eastworks. Um it, it, now it's it, it's this beautiful paved bike path, but for me it was a very poorly lit um ramshackle railroad track that you could get in trouble in. Mm. And I did get in trouble there <laughs> many times. Um but for someone that wants to hang on to yes, I mean, th- there's a certain amount of gentrification that happens as you know dilapidated or you know urban areas are revitalized. But along with that, there, there's so much growth, there's so much more safety and happiness and vibrancy. I think that really outweighs any kind of any kind of thoughts of, of yesteryear that you may be hanging on to. And and for me, as you know, a longtime resident, it feels good. It feels good to see the area you know, come up and, and, and there's so much to do for, for people of all ages, you know, it's kids, it's adults, it's married people, it's single people. Um, there's just so much to do. It's really, it's a bit overwhelming even for a town that small that I grew up in where there was nothing to do to be a part of this, this resurgence. It it feels great. And I think that, um, I'm probably in a happy majority about that. Especially in the end cap building for like the Pleasant Street mill revitalization as they go mill by mill, which we are not going to because it's hard to remember yes, which I ones can't remember which mills which. Mills which. Yeah. Keystone, so it's, it's, it's 180, 180, and then Paragon, Here we and go then again. Keystone, and then <laughs> Brickyard. That's correct. Brickyard, yeah. and then Eastworks. But the success of the mills has been something remarkable. And I mean, I live in a mill town in Turner's Falls, and there have been all these talks for many, many years about trying to revitalize those mills. And now they're finally going to demolish one of them because it wasn't able to happen in that same way. The fact that so many of those mills in a row on essentially one street in East Hampton are all in their own way coming up is, uh, I think, a remarkable feat. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that speaks a little bit to, to Massachusetts as a state in general, where they're not just worried about Boston. There's a lot of programs that are helping these revitalization, revitalization efforts um, take off. Uh, Ludlow's another great example. Right. Yeah, you know, these these buildings, you know, it, once they were vacated, they really left the populations of the town desolate. That's why Peter Pan's was there. It's an unfortunate, you know, uh, reality. And it, it's nice to 
be putting that past behind us. I feel like I should say, like, I always wished I had the courage to go in, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> if the old owner of Peter Pan's is listening right now, I will say that I did go in a couple times and it was nicer than I thought it would be. I love going to old dive <laughs> bars. It's like my new favorite thing to do. Yeah, it can... Old Polish clubs yeah, that I could never yeah. get into before that I weasel my way in even though I'm not Polish. Yep, yep. It's like my great joy in life at this point. <laughs> They're gonna, hey, two dollar cocktails. Pol- I call it Polish bar hopping, and I love it. <laughs> well, I mean, like, just in case people want to feel real involved, you can have like a card. <laughs> Get a card. Yeah, they can feel more like like the old World War II days when you had to have a card to get in. Yeah, yeah. Kalisa's sort of been thing. to the St. Casimir Society in Turners. I'm a member there now. I'm ma- I can make you a member. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe we should have matchbooks too that you can take when you leave. That I love. That's uh, <laughs> don't smoke, kids. <laughs> Even even when you're coming to the Jupiter Club, right around the corner from Insa. <laughs> yeah, there you go. A lot of fun in that one area. You've got um, you're already planning some series for the space. You've got a Thursday Lounge series that is going to be launching, helmed by Suda Baker Hawk, I do believe. And part of why I believe that is because I do believe I'm going to be co-DJing on a night. Ooh. I hope so. Um, I can't wait to find out when. We love DJ <laughs> Suda Baker Hawk. He's been on the show a couple times, I think. Yeah. Oh, really? Awesome. Yeah. Oh, Bex is going to be joining him for one of those, too. NEPM Jazz All Mode host Bex Taylor. <laughs> Both of those folks, part of uh, Peace and Rhythm, the record label. Mm-hmm. So if you want to get up close and personal with, with us and our playlists, you can do so at this new club later on in the year. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, um, I'm just checking my list to make sure my information is correct here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, some of that involves um, a surf night, like a, a tiki night with um, you know rum-inspired cocktails, and just we're going to have lounge nights as well, and um, you know vinyl. And we're really looking to be to add something to the cultural resurgence, but also be different. I'm on deck for the yacht rock night. Yeah, uh, yeah, yacht rock. That sounds fun. Yeah. It will be. It's exciting to see spaces like that that like really needed to get used get used. And so even though it is in some small part a part of gentr- gentrification as a whole, like there's something about like bringing like necessary spaces to communities in that way too. I miss like also that's my old neighborhood and I miss it so much. <laughs> <laughs> It's Sean's old neighborhood, too, kind of. He grew up in East Hampton. I didn't grow up in that neighborhood, but... Um, Got in trouble there enough? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, I have fond memories. The whole area is going to transform mm-hmm. pretty dramatically, Eastworks included. It won't just be the Jupiter Club. It's just going to get better and better, and we really want to be an anchor of that building that, that's drawing people in. I do also miss an Eastworks, because Eastworks used to have this weird, scary room at the end of the hall. They hadn't finished the floors, like it was just like a weird empty space, but it had this other room that was just called the hot room. And there were all these warning things on the door. (laughs) Sounds like a great place for an underwear party. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It was the creepiest thing ever. It was really frightening to be in in the dark. And I weirdly missed the whole space would make a great like haunted uh, like around Halloween time. Oh yeah, yeah. like some haunted studio. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You could do that too, Sean Mitchell. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we're filling you full of ideas today. I I know, I know. The solar system's the limit. With the (laughs) Jupiter Club set to open on July 18th in Eastworks in East Hampton. Thanks so much for telling us about your new vision and your new business. Thank you so much for having me today. No problem. Good luck. Quick breaking news note. J.D. Vance has been selected as the vice presidential nominee. More from the Republican National Convention tonight on 88.5 and listen for the red in a blue state coverage coming from the NEPM News Department all this week. Next... The Misery Index is making my leather lung feel like an iron flame. All hell, street trash, thy will be done. These are not weather reports or throwaway insults. These are all names of bands playing the RPM heavy music camp out at the end of the summer. And up next, we'll talk to mastermind metalhead himself, Brian Westbrook, about bringing metal to Montague. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by the UMass Five College Credit Union, offering co-op advantage checking with cash back on all purchases, plus secure debit card controls, all from the UMass Five mobile banking app. Insured by NCUA, umass5.coop.
Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Khalees Smith. Three days of heavy music, culture, community, and camping come to Montague this Labor Day weekend. It's the return of the heavy music culture campout at the Miller's Falls Rod and Gun Club, otherwise known as RPM Fest. They'll be having an event to get out. More info about the festival this weekend, July 21st, at Prodigy in East Hampton. And joining us to talk about the history of the festival in the Valley's perhaps lesser known and lesser celebrated penchant for heavy music is festival founder Brian Westbrook, owner of PDP Productions, which throws the festival along with promoter health Head Entertainment. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs> we have a person who works here named Kara Foster, who makes so much run here behind the scenes at NEPM, and we had a promo running all weekend long talking about the heavy music camp out that I included a little bit of metal music as part of. Awesome. With that band Prong, that yep. was the intro music, and uh, <laughs> Kara was very thrilled to hear a little tiny bit <laughs> of metal on on public radio. That's awesome to yeah. hear. Love we're, it. We're encouraging of it. So um, let's talk about the, the origins of this festival. Uh, you started it at your house. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a time. Um yeah, so uh, b- basically going going back, we um Promoter Head Entertainment who's uh uh spearheaded by my business partner John Gulo. Um started booking shows in, you know, Northampton, Florence area, uh specifically at JJ's Tavern for a number of years back in like 2012. Um we started RPM Fest basically as a celebration of the local music scene just because we wanted to put every band that we liked and enjoyed all on one show together. Um, we were searching around for the right venue to do it. Eventually, um, you know, my parents happened to own some property in Greenfield, and uh, my mom finally was like, why don't you just do it in our backyard? I'm like, well, we weren't going to push that, but <laughs> since you offered. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so we, we had the festival there for the first three years before uh, – you know, noise complaints and generally outgrowing the site uh, forced us to move. So we took a year off and now we're at the Miller's Falls Rod and Gun Club in Montague, where we still are today. How many people came that last year and were in your parents' backyard? Oh, boy. Um, I want to <laughs> say we, I think we ended up selling around 200 tickets that year, plus, uh, you know, bands, volunteers, other mm-hmm. people on site. It was, uh, it was pretty packed. You know, we probably could have fit more people. But parking started to be the issue there. Just uh, it turned into a puzzle of fitting all the cars in that we needed. So, how many people you know. come now, or came last year? Or you anticipate having this year? Well, uh, we are. I think last year we had about eleven hundred to twelve hundred people on site between ticket sales, bands, vendors, etc. Um, I, you know, I think we're probably gonna sh- we're shooting for higher than that this year, obviously, um, and we're we're about on pace to 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 break that number. So. Cool. What's changed since that first inception in in a backyard in in, in oh, Greenfield boy. to to now like moving to a new venue and like you know try aiming for ten times larger? Yeah, I mean just a lot of experience about what works, what doesn't. Um, you know, I've I work at other festivals and I'm an audio engineer by day, so I do live sound. Um, j- just a lot of. Uh, Absorbing what happens at other events and learning and progressing from there um, and just, you know, trying to up our production level and our, you know, hospitality and all that stuff uh, year after year, just trying to make the next fest better than the previous one. So We're speaking with Brian Westbrook, who is the founder of the RPM Fest, which happens Labor Day weekend, but there's an event at Prodigy in East Hampton on July 21st to talk more about it. I was having dinner with a couple in their mid-70s yesterday, and they were asking who's going to be on the show today, and I said, we're going to be talking to the guy behind the RPM campout, and they immediately knew who you were because of <laughs> lawn signs. Oh, So, yeah. like, we're in the middle of political season, and you may see all sorts of lawn signs out there, but the one that I think a lot of people, maybe the reason people know you most is because of these lawn signs. Two questions. Yes. First one, why... Uh, advertise with lawn signs, and has that been actually effective? Oh, way forget the word out. Well, uh, I think you can answer your own question there. <laughs> uh, absolutely, yes. Like uh, you know, we do some like post fest surveys, and a, a large number of people say they first heard about the fest through the yard signs. The second um, question is: the first time I saw the lawn signs, I was like, "Why are you?" And I think I know the answer to this one mm-hmm. too. Why are you calling it heavy music campout? 
and not heavy metal camp. Mm. Doesn't heavy metal camp out just have a better ring to it? It does, but you know, not everything we book is specifically metal. That is you exactly know? the answer exactly. that I knew we, was going to be behind we it. We delve into some internal yeah. politics. Like I'm not a metal band. Don't put metal on it, my poster. Exactly. So <laughs> RPM, <laughs> RPM actually stands for rock, punk, and metal. Ah, like, okay. Um, you know, strangely enough, when we were naming the fest, I don't recall any sort of discussion. It was just, it's called RPM Fest. Okay, that's it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we we try to you know incorporate all facets of heavy music. You know, uh, a couple of years ago we even had a bunch of ska bands on. Uh, so how did that go over? Uh, <laughs> I played in one of them, so uh, hopefully well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's you know there's there's all sorts of uh, different branches of heavy music, but whether it's rock, punk, metal, hardcore, thrash, grindcore. Yeah. You I was can, I was obsessed with the Mighty Mighty yeah. Boss when I was a kid, and there's exactly. a, there's a metal element to that ska band. Oh exactly. yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, like like there's it's it's kind of ska punk as opposed to like straight up ska, and yeah. that's that's its own thing. And the punk element definitely brings in something a little bit heavier. Um, that said, like the the range of bands that you get for this thing, and the amount of bands that you get for this thing is kind of nuts. Like you wouldn't necessarily like every music scene is larger than people who aren't a part of it understand that it is but like talk about the the local heavy metal or just like louder heavier music scene which you are definitely a part of and we'll talk about your band in a little bit too oh, absolutely um yeah so you know like i said we started uh really booking shows with on a regular basis you know in 20, 2011 2012 those those years um and we were doing shows at jj's tavern uh slash the 13th floor music lounge Pretty much weekly for a number of years. Um, you know, obviously, the pandemic kind of slowed that down, and now there's other other folks booking that space. Um, but yeah, we you know we we had a really really strong thing going for a long time. Uh, like I said, pretty much weekly shows, always packed the place out. Um, and now we're branching out a little more, booking at different venues. Um, you know, other other spots have opened up around the area. Um, but you know, a lot of like. Specifically in Western Mass, um, we've had a you know really strong heavy music scene even before we were doing things here. Um, you know, a lot of the nationally known uh, like metal bands from the area, like you know Kill Switch Engage, Shadows Fall, the Acacia Strain, all those bands are local to Western Massachusetts, um, and you know kind of it's always been a uh, real hot spot for heavy music. So you know this is just a continuation in a celebration of that i guess it's not just folk music in the valley folks <laughs> we run the gamut <laughs> but i will say i think maybe it's a good time to take a break we're going to talk more with brian uh, westbrook from the rpm music festival happening labor day weekend with an event corresponding to it this uh, july 21st with prodigy in east hampton but you know we replaced an hour of classical music when our show launched here i think classical music fans if they're not already into metal and heavy music, they really need to get into it. Maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that on the other side. I mean, I agree with that for sure. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 and EPM. Yes. <laughs> Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. What band is this we're listening to, Khalees? Oh, well, you know, since we have a member of Power Up with us, I felt like we needed to play a little bit of their music, too. So this is Power Up. Right Which is now. Brian Westbrook's band, and yes. Brian Westbrook is behind the Heavy Music Camp Out, the RPM Fest. Not the Heavy Metal Camp Out, much to my dismay every time I see those. It's because it's signs, more than metal, Monty. I know, but people need to just, you know, get to go for the. The, so the sonic sounds of the, uh, you know, the way that the event is called. Anyway, As that Tenacious aside. As Tenacious D would say, embrace the metal. Embrace the metal. I mentioned on the other side that classical music fans, if they don't think they like metal, might be more interested in metal than you might imagine. Um, what's you, and I think of it as because, you know, I can play every power chord that certain bands play on the guitar, and I'm not a guitar player. But even what you just heard right there and other types of metal that you hear... They're playing the kind of arpeggios that you, you know, you go to the conservatory to learn on the violin. Talk about the the synergy between classical music and uh, this heavy music. Oh, boy. I mean, you know, there are plenty of, uh, you know, technical metal bands that really incorporate, like, neoclassical techniques and, you know, theory and that sort of thing. Um, you know, you know, uh, 
artists that come to mind, you know, uh, like some of the you know famous guitar shredders. Uh, um, I've drawn blanks on names. Ingve, but Malmsteen. You know, there you go. Thank you. That's the one. <laughs> I feel, yeah. like, I feel like, like you put that one in specifically for our director, Tony, who is yeah. also... Yes. He's a shredder. A love, he's a shredder. But exactly. I mean, I learned about... I was a metalhead as a kid, and I was in a metal band, and I learned about Paganini's Caprices on the violin <laughs> because they're the kind of arpeggios you hear in heavy metal music. And then that, in turn, turned me on to certain classical music. I feel like if there were people that used to listen to the classical music at this time... They should maybe give heavy metal a chance. I th- I I agree with that. You can I listen to should. it quietly if you need to listen to it quietly. <laughs> yeah, and it's beautiful, and it's really. I mean, these are really really talented musicians playing at usually speeds that blow the human mind. Mm. <laughs> Speaking of crossing music uh, genre divides, um, the last time we saw you was running sound for Green River Festival, yes. which is full of very different styles. Of <laughs> there music. wasn't a ton of metal, except well, no, there's no there no, was no yeah, metal. no, there's no metal. There was some cumbia punk. There you yes. go. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. That there was I a was, mosh pit. I was very ex- That was the only time I think I will ever see a circle pit at Green River Festival. That and was I was awesome. in it, by the way. That was so cool. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to expect when, when they came on stage. I was like, oh, this is what's happening. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Some Rumpet Pero was, it was so, so much fun. But like, there's clearly lessons that you've taken from doing Green River Festival for a number of years that you really did get to bring back and that you are bringing back every year to make this festival run smoother. What's something that Green River Festival has taught you about dealing with the metalheads who come to the woods? Ooh, I mean, just in general, like on a, on a bigger level, just the, the production side of things, like the layout of the site where to put the vendors, where to put porta potties, God forbid. Uh, uh, the, the bigger picture things like that are really what I take away from you know the festivals that I typically work. Um, the, the other thing is, I mean, the people that go to Green River Festival are nice and friendly, and they have a reputation of being nice and friendly, but the reputation or the perceived reputation mm. of metal heads is that they're scary, and they wear yeah. leather, and they've got chains, and, and they, they have tattoos, things. and they break, yeah, long hair and beards. Talk about who comes to these festivals oh, like what type of people are actually coming well if if the metalheads weren't the nicest people in the world i wouldn't still be dealing with them after 15 16 years of, <laughs> of doing shows and stuff um yeah we've got a really tight knit loving community some of the you know nicest friendliest people i've ever known um and you know it should say something that you know, our security team at rpm fest uh has a maybe one or two incidents per year for a festival with over a thousand attendees. Like we really don't have to deal with anything. Everybody's self policing. Even in the mosh pits, you know, the general rule is somebody goes down, you pick them up. That's you know, it's it's one of those it's it's all about the community and the friendships and that's what it's always always been about. Uh, really briefly, because we've got a, a limited amount of time left, yeah. but like, talk about the event that's happening this Sunday, where we can yes. go to a place with mini golf and learn more about <laughs> heavy metal. So, uh, yeah, Prodigy has been one of our uh, longtime sponsors of the festival. They are the fire starter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different Prodigy. Different prodigy, prodigy is a place in East Hampton, but it was also a band that had a song that was a hit called Firestarter. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we're doing an event there. Um, we're, we're just uh, setting up the merch table. We're doing some challenges for the uh, mini golf and the table sports and the video games that they have there. Uh, you can win tickets, you can win merchandise, um, and if you just want to come up by and buy your ticket, uh, we're offering a discounted rate for the tickets there. So. Are, are you a nonprofit? You're at rpmfest.org. We are, are you not operate a nonprofit. like because you're all volunteer it's, run and things like that. But we're, we're technically not a nonprofit. Um, there's a lot involved with with making it such, but yeah, you know, we basically everything we make we put back into the festival anyway. And like like you mentioned, it's all volunteer run. We have a great crew behind it. Um, and that's the only reason the festival happens is because we have a lot of people that love the event, want to see it succeed, and they, they keep coming back every year. When is Power Up going to actually accept one of our invites to come in for live uh, music Friday? I, we've been trying. I know. I, I really want to. <laughs> we um, have to brace the studio for you. We've really had to talk to people. Like, if this band comes in this week, we're going to have to do it in a different studio because they're way too big and way too loud. If we can get, if we can schedule something in, uh, far enough in advance, I could absolutely make it happen. Okay. We'd, I know we'd love to do it. All right. Make these promises. Yes. <laughs> um, my last question for you, Brian Westbrook. Yep. RPM Fest, they have the list of all the bands that are playing. They're maybe not uh, common household names. And so why do they use such 
illegible fonts. <laughs> I cannot read the fonts was, of half of these bands on these posters. One, what is the deal with one that? One of them we were looking at, and we're like, it's literally like a graphic. And it looks like a we, box. Yeah, we have yes. to go X in the middle to their of it. site, and it's Nixil. It's Nixil, But yes. it definitely doesn't look like there's anything in that name but an N and an X. You should see some of the more like extreme like death metal bands. It literally just looks like a blob. Like I don't know if you've seen that meme where there's just a pile of sticks on the ground, and it's like, yo, I found my new ba- death metal band logo. <laughs> It yes. definitely looks like that. And you can see bands off. using that type of font and playing excellent music in a kind and friendly way in the woods in Montague at Labor Day weekend at the Miller's Falls Rod and Gun Club. Is there anyone in particular that you're looking forward to seeing on stage when RPM co- Fest comes around? Uh, don't make me pick a band. Yeah, I'm going to oh, make man. you pick a band. Um, or like three. Honestly, Prong would be, I'm very much looking forward to Prong. That's like, you know, classic thrash groove band. Um yeah, let's let's stick with them. But honestly, every band in the lineup is incredible. We got a lot of really good up and coming bands, a lot of bands from out of town, um, and then of course a lot of our strong local scene. So. Only one that I saw in Chainmail, which is this band, Castle Rat. Castle mm. Rat seems yes. amazing. They have like a medieval like uh, fantasy theme Very with all cool. of them. Yes. Brian Westbrook from RPM Fest, RPMFest.org, dot org. Right. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs> I think we all know what the worst arachnid is. It's why you need to be careful in the woods and check your dogs and kids and self for ones that have attached to you. But if you find one, there's a place in Amherst that might be able to help you out. Tomorrow on the Fabulous 413, we're going total tick. We're taking you to the Tick Report lab in Amherst. We will learn everything you need to know about tick safety, tick diseases, and whether or not and how to get that tick that has lodged itself onto you off of your body. I'm Monty Belmonte. I'm Clee Smith. We will talk to you tomorrow with the ticks on the Fabulous 413.